And um, just to let you know, we've turned the corner. We're in the, the second major portion of Isaiah, and there's a new study guide out in the vestibule. Um, if you're looking for it, it gives you a road map, the outline for the rest of Isaiah. Um, and so if you want to pick that up, you can get that today. Um, by now, I think you've got a pretty good feel for the book of Isaiah. There's really two major divisions. The theme overall is that through judgment, God saves his people. And so we see judgment and salvation in this book. The opening 35 chapters took place during Isaiah's lifetime and his ministry, and it focused heavily upon the pending judgment, that they were worthy of this judgment and God was going to bring it. Um, and then the latter part of the book jumps ahead some 150 years now to a message for those who are going to come out of the captivity. Um, the, the book that we looked at um, historically ends in about Isaiah's lifetime, the his, historical interlude. Remember that? It all dealt with Hezekiah the last couple of weeks. Um, how the Assyrian army came against him and God delivered his people, struck down 185,000 uh, soldiers. And then Hezekiah's life was extended, and then the Babylonians came, and uh, he showed them everything, and God said, you're going to be judged for this. All the possessions of the royal household are going to be carried off into captivity and your descendants as well. Well, that happened about 100 years later, as far as there was three deportations that took place. Then they were in captivity for about 70 years. Um, as a people. So everybody that went into captivity probably died in the captivity. And so there's a new generation. And Isaiah, back in 701 BC, is writing to them some 150, 160 years down the road. And he has a message for them from God, and it has to do with God's salvation. And that's what we're going to focus on for the rest of this book. Now, he's writing, keep in mind, he's already passed from the scene, and this letter is going to be read to individuals to encourage them. And he actually he actually mentions the guy by name who is going to have the decree to set the people free to go back to Jerusalem. His name is Cyrus. And so there's a lot of critics who look at the book of Isaiah and say, how could Isaiah possibly know the man's name who would set these people free? Well, we, we all know the answer to that. That's real easy, right? God knows everything, and it's not a big deal for him to disclose to his prophet Isaiah. He'll be called Cyrus. It's not really a big deal. But the focus on this part of the book really focuses on the Messiah. And it, there's a promise that we'll look at in the first several chapters, about 10 chapters of deliverance, that the people of God, the nation, will be delivered. But then it, it takes an interesting turn, because the deliverer, the one who will deliver them and, and rescue them, is a suffering servant. And that's really not what you expect. And yet this is God's means to bring about salvation, is that the Messiah would suffer on our behalf. And then there's a projection out there that goes past the present to the future glory. Um, so we're going to be looking at chapters 40 through 66 for a good part of this year. And I would tell you that I'm already just really pleased with chapter 40. It is such a good book. I don't know if you had a chance to read it in advance today, but this chapter is just flooded with some really important things. And I, and I, I wish I could tell you I felt up to the task because this is really a gift to us. The people that were receiving this some 150 years after Isaiah died were people who had been suffering. They were in captivity. The passage that we're going to look at today actually talks about their suffering as if they're in constant warfare. And it will actually say that they will have received double for their sins. So you should not imagine this as, as Gitmo. This is not a place where they got big screen TVs and good meals and a, and a soccer field. This was harsh for the people of God, this captivity. And again, the people who were now coming out of it were probably either very young when they went into it or born, so they really don't know. They didn't see firsthand all that God had done back in the land and destroying the enemies there, 185,000 that one particular day. So it's the context of suffering, and that always is important for us, isn't it? Um, who amongst us has not suffered? Now, as soon as I say that, in my mind I'm thinking, here we're talking about captivity versus our suffering in our modern day. And I would encourage you to be careful not to always evaluate it and put your suffering down as if it's insignificant. No doubt, if you've got a dog bite, you can always find someone who's been bitten by a shark, right? There's always someone who can outdo you. But in God's economy, the things that you suffer are extremely important because he uses that for our good to draw us closer, to teach us humility. So don't disregard the suffering that God is taking you through. And I know in our church, many of you have suffered many different things. It can be relationships. And I was reminded last night, sometimes it's relationships because of the cause of Christ that go astray. 
uh, because you're in a particular situation where you have to say, this is God's standards and I simply cannot be accepting of what you're doing. I love you and the door is open when you come back. But what you're doing, I, I cannot entertain nor encourage. Others, it's been financial things, but I also think about so many individuals who've lost loved ones. And as I thought about this week, I wasn't just thinking about those of you who've lost a spouse or a parent, but I was talking about thinking about even some, some, some moms who lost a child within the womb. And, and that's, that's a heartache that, that, that men, dads, just really don't understand. And so we are a people who understand suffering in our own context. And there's been loneliness that goes with it. There's confusion. Uh, there can be hurt feelings. There can be fear. There can just be pain emotionally and physically. It can just be the taste of a bitter life. And so this chapter really helps us because it asks and answers this question. When you are suffering, what do you need? When you are suffering, what do you need? And if you look at the title of the sermon, you're going to find there's three things that this passage will remind us that we need. What are they? Number one, we need comfort, right? We need someone to come alongside of us and, and soothe us in our pain and be with us through the difficult and hard times. We also need confidence, don't we? That tomorrow will be a new day. This too shall pass. And then the third thing that we need is strength. Because we've got we to gotta continue to live this life even though we're suffering and we're going through a hard time. So comfort, confidence, and strength. But what I like about this chapter, it actually answers a more important question. Because we often ask or we'll tell people what they need when they're suffering, but this passage reminds us it's not what we need is the most important, but rather who we need. And this passage points us to the Lord God Almighty. We are reminded of His glory, of His majesty, and of His greatness. And in light of who He is, he provides for his people comfort, confidence, and strength. Um, clearly, you can see that this chapter could be divided into three sermons, and that would normally be my tendency to do that. Um, but I feel like the continuity of this chapter as a whole is very important for us to take hold of. So I wanted to do it all today. So with that being said, we'll be text heavy. Um, we've got all these verses I want to read through. I'll try and keep the illustrations kind of light but I believe that we'll see the application is clear and essential. Go to the end of the, the chapter, verse 27 and following. Again, you're going to be familiar with these verses as we close out, and I want to read um, this section, not only because it's familiar, because there seems to be two embedded questions that Isaiah is answering in this chapter, and the second one is found in verse 27. If you are suffering, it would seem that you would ask a lot of questions, and one of them might be this question. Has God forgotten me? Is God too busy? Is he occupied with other things? Am I not that important to him? Has God forgotten me? And it seems like as he closes out the chapter that that seems to be the focus answering that question. So if you would please stand with me as I read Isaiah 40, 27 through 31. And again, be encouraged by the closing verses that you know. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Uh, Kevin Tapp, would you please pray for us this morning as we look at God's Word? Father, we pray, Lord, I think it's time to come together as fellow believers, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that you'll plant the seed in our hearts. We pray for Pastor Steve to bring us the Word. We pray we'll buy your Word. We pray we'll be a light. Amen. You may be seated. So let's get right to it. We're going to look at, first of all, His glory, which is the source of our comfort. And I would challenge you as we go through this to think about how these are connected. His glory becomes the source of our comfort. Look at chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. Comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned. 
for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, and you're familiar with this, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's just drop in for just a moment, and again, think about Isaiah. I've pointed this out several times, but remember Isaiah's ministry was not a very encouraging one. He was to take the message of God, and it was going to close their eyes, close their ears, and harden their hearts. Then, as we read in chapters 37 and following, the next thing he has to do is go to Hezekiah. Hezekiah, you're about to die. Great ministry, right? Your world's going to fall apart. And then after, Isaiah blow, after Hezekiah blows it, he goes back to him and says, Okay, what'd you do? You showed them all the stuff. All of us going to be carried off into captivity and your descendants as well. This is such a wonderful opportunity to rejoice in God, right? What a ministry. And now he gets to write a message of comfort. Comfort, says the Lord. Comfort my people, says the Lord. But he doesn't even get to be around when it is read to the people to whom it's addressed. It's some 150, 150 years after this particular point. Now, with that being said, the message for this future group is comfort. There is coming a Messiah. The warfare is ended. Your punishment is sufficient. has been doubled. And now we have this statement tied to John the Baptist, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Why? Because Messiah is coming. The Lord's glory is going to be revealed. And everyone is going to see it. It's going to be put on display. And it is secure. Why? Because the Lord has spoken. Now, to give you an idea, imagine, if you will, putting this in our modern day context. Imagine someone is up at the lectern and it's a press release and they're basically reading this information to you. You're hearing it for the first time. Comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak comfort, so forth and so on. He is coming. His glory is going to be revealed and everyone's going to see his glory. It's going to be great. Okay. And then after the press release goes out, the next thing is what questions do you have? What questions do you have this morning? Messiah is coming. Everything's going to be turned around. It's all going to work out just fine. What are your questions? I would anticipate some of the questions would be something like this. Uh, when is that going to happen? Uh, my family and I, we've been in captivity for about 60 years. Uh, when do we expect an end to this, right? You can hear the Jerusalem Times or the Babylon Herald, right, raising the questions. It's all fake news, by the way, right? So when's it going to happen? They're probably wondering, how's it going to happen, right? Uh, what's going to take place? What's going to be the sequence? But the Lord wants us to redirect to more important questions because there are more important questions that need to be addressed rather than when and how. And the question that Isaiah and the Lord wants through Isaiah for us to see is really the more pressing question is, can God do this? Is God able to free his people from captivity? And so Isaiah now in writing is going to start to work on that theme a little bit now, but more when we get to verse 12, but he begins by reminding them that at the foundation, God is able, first and foremost, because he is God who is a promise keeper. If he has made a promise, if he said something, it will take place. So look at how this develops beginning in verse 6 as he starts to push them towards that question, is God able? Verse 6, the voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? Now notice this. There's, there's a sense of the frailty of things. All flesh is grass. And all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. So do you already start to see he's starting to build this idea of how great God is? Everything else just withers and all God has to do is just blow. And it will be pushed aside. Now, now look at this, because now he wants them to get the right focus. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who will bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up and be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Now, I want to stop right there, because I really like those three words, don't you? So he's already starting to paint this picture of how great God is, and that's really the focus, that God is able. And he's saying, now get up on high. Get to the highest point. And when you get up there, announce to the people who are struggling, who are suffering, behold your God. Because that's who you need to look to. 
That needs to be your focus, not on your suffering, but rather upon your God. Behold your God. And through the rest of this chapter, we're going to have that theme come up over and over again. Behold your God. Behold your God. Is he coming? Yes, he will come. And when God comes with the advent of the Lord, with the Messiah, keep in mind there are always two portions of his advent. When you think about the Lord coming, I would dare say that you typically think of the blessing, his hand of mercy and tenderness. Do you think of that? If you do, be of good cheer. He has worked in your heart and you want him to come and take care of you. But don't forget that he comes also with judgment. And in this passage, we're reminded of those two hands, one of strength and judgment and the other one in tenderness like a shepherd. And we're reminded of those very fundamental themes again, that God is both just and the justifier. God is just. His judgments are always right and true, and we deserve them. But praise be to God by his grace. He is also the justifier who puts the penalty upon his son, Jesus Christ that we might be his righteousness. So look at how, how he develops this now in verses 10 and 11. Behold, there it is again, behold your God, behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. That's, that's the hand of judgment. Now look at the tender hand. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Don't you like that representation of our God? To try and give us a picture of him, he is to us who have trusted in Christ a shepherd. And he, and he takes care of us like little sheep in his arms. You know, I, I have to stop for just a moment. When he comes his second time, he will come in judgment and he will come in mercy and salvation. And I want to ask you today, which hand will you receive? Will you receive his judgment because you're still dead in your sins and you haven't cried out for mercy? Or will you be an individual who receives his tenderness because you are that individual who's trusted in Jesus Christ? Do you know what it is to have your iniquity pardoned? Do you know what it is to know his forgiveness and the surety of his word? If he has spoken, if he has promised, it is settled. If you know him, then I would say you know his tenderness, don't you? But I want you to know that's just a glimpse of what is to come. One day when he comes, it's going to be a full embrace and faith will become sight and all of our cares will be cast upon him in a way that we've never understood, never could comprehend to be cared for by him. So this is his glory and this is the source of our comfort. Let's go on though. I want to keep pressing on to his majesty. This is the source of our confidence. And now he's really going to get into this. Well, maybe I should ask you this question. How, how majestic is your God? How, how big of a view do you have of his grandeur and his glory and his majesty? When you think about God, is it like a, a very puny representation? Or do you just get a glimpse of his unveiled glory, even in the throne room perhaps, where the light casts out all shadows and there's no hidden places in his presence? A, a, a brilliance that is piercing. How many of you saw in, in the recent weeks that one sunset that looked like a fire in the sky? Wasn't that brilliant? That is nothing compared to the majesty of our God. And in order that we might have some understanding, what God often does is he raises questions. And ladies, for those of you who are doing the joy of, of the fear of God this week, you're going to actually see that Isaiah 40 is pointed out in this particular passage. Because there's a couple rhetorical questions that are being raised here by God to say, how big do you think I am? How majestic do you think I am? There was a guy who was asked some questions in the Old Testament. His name was Job. Do you remember him? Around 38, God says to him, you think you're big enough? Put on your big boy pants. I got some questions for you. And you remember what Job said? I think I opened my mouth once or twice. I'm going to go ahead and close it at this particular point. That's the nature of these questions. It's to provoke within us the need to get low before this great and majestic God. So listen now to just verses 12 through 14. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Weighed mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or his counselor has taught him? 
With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Do you get, get a picture here of what's going on? Back off, brother. Back off, sister. Because now we're talking about the Lord God Almighty. I don't think I can get much water in my hand. But God's hand is to be pictured as so large that all the moisture of all the, all the universe can fit there. My hand, I measured it out. It's nine inches. And I, I wanted to know that because every now and then I'll measure a piece of wood. How big is this piece of wood? Is it eight inches? Is it 10 inches? Mine is, I have a very good thumb. My thumb stretches way out. Most of you only get about seven or eight. I get nine inches with my hand. I can't measure hardly any space. But God says my hand is as if the measurement of the whole universe. What are mountains? How heavy? How big? He weighs them with his scales. The dust. He knows the dust, the elements of the dust. No one's taught him. No one's been his counselor. Wow. Like Job, we ought to just get low and get quiet. And then we get some interesting comparisons. He's going to talk about the nations. What are the nations? He's going to say the nations are like a drop in the bucket. And then he's going to talk about Lebanon. Do you remember what Lebanon was famous for? I'm sure you do. It's cedars, right? Brilliant cedars. That's where if you were building something and you wanted wood, you went and got those trees. And what he's going to say is, Lebanon, it's great. There's all these beautiful trees. It is not sufficient to burn an offering before God. You can gather every tree that ever, was, ever existed, ever grew, burn it down, it won't be enough. There's not enough animals, he's going to say, to be sufficient. Well, let's, I'm talking about it. Let's read it. Verse 15 and following, Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket, and are counted as small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its be sufficient for burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God? Or, or what likeness will you compare him? The workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, the silversmith cast it, cast silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Do you see what's going on here, these comparisons? I mean, it's kind of like, how do you describe him? He's created the stars. He's named every one of them. You know, don't, don't go on registry, starregistry.com. They've already been named, okay? Tell them you love them some other way than naming a star after them. It's already God's got it all covered. The point that God wants us to see is that He is God and we're not. The palm of His hand measures the heaven. It is not, there's not enough anything sufficient for the worship of God. Idols are a joke. He raises up kings and princes and, and, and judges and He puts them down again. God wants us to see how great and majestic He is. So, um, I've noticed in the news there's a, the, a new trend taking place. Some of you maybe have seen this, maybe not. It's uh, what the modern dads are now doing with their young daughters. Have you seen this? They're going to ballet classes with their daughters. Anybody seen this on YouTube or on the news? So, so these are these little girls in their ballet classes, and they look like they're under 10 or so. And so they're going out and prancing around, and the dads are coming right behind them, prancing in their ballet. Okay, and this is all being filmed, okay? So when my daughter was young. I have no problem dancing with her at home. That would be okay. You weren't going to film me, though. This was not going to happen, okay? And, and so, dads, I'm not sure what's going on, okay? What I do have to commend the modern-day dad, though, if that's what you need to do to establish that relationship with your daughter, then go put on your tights, okay? <laughs> Because one of the things that you as a dad and you as a mom want to do the same thing, you want to develop that relationship so your child will trust you. So when, when, when there's a need, they know they can come running to you and grab a hold of your leg. Uh, there's, there's a little one that comes on Saturday night. Every time she sees me, she comes up and just grabs my leg. And, and for me, I'm, I'm bigger than her. Uh, something obviously feels like she can trust now. And the same thing is true when the child's stuck in a tree that's where, especially a dad, but a mom too, that's where you want to be, right? You can jump to me, and you want to have your child in a situation where they know, I can trust you. 
You're bigger than me, and you're going to care for me. Folks, this is what God wants us to see at this particular juncture of Scripture. Our God is able, and he is a great and awesome God, a majestic God, and this should yield confidence for you and I to trust him. If he created all things, if he names all the stars, if he controls all the leaders, if he can blow and something disappears, do you not think for a moment that he can take care of you? Our God is able. He speaks and it is done. And to know Him, to really know Him, is what the Bible speaks about as true salvation. To know Him is salvation. And to know Him on that level demands confidence. So when we go through a trial, when we go through a struggle, we can say, what is this present struggle? What is this present trial? In light of eternity, what is it? It's not that big a deal, right? But there's a more important comparison that we need to see right here. What is this trial in light of our God? And when we see our God for who He is, it is as nothing. He can take care of us. Now, would you say amen so far? God comforts us. He gives us confidence. But here's where our problem comes in. Because even though today on Sunday we're going to affirm this, guess what we got to do tomorrow? we got to get up and go back to it, right? So here on Sunday, great. Praise the Lord. Got a comfort. Got a confidence. But i got to go to work. I've got children, which means I have laundry, which I have dishes. If you're young, you have homework, and your lips probably hurt because they're probably chapped, right? So where's the chapstick when I need it, right? We still have problems. So listen to this final portion. And again, because you know these verses, but listen to it once again and be renewed once again. Why would you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Again, has God forgotten us? The answer is no. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And again, folks, it is in context. If you're suffering, this is the verse that you want. Isn't this wonderful to know? Right there it is. God is on the job. Behold your God. Who is he? He's the everlasting God. Behold your God. Who is he? He's the creator of all. Behold your God. He is working for you all the time for your good and comfort. Behold your God. He is wise. His understanding is unsearchable. Isn't this good to know? But there's something else as I move to a couple concluding thoughts. I've got two of them. But there's something embedded in this passage that is extremely important for us to catch. And we probably wouldn't because our minds are not as quick to the Jewish mindset as they need to be. But I want to point it out to you. We're doing well, right? We're here today. We're affirming. God is a glorious God and we're comforted. God is a majestic God, and we have confidence. God is a great God. He's our source of strength. So all that we say, amen, right? But then why is it we continue to wrestle with these things? Why is it that today there's, like, there's some connection going on between our heart and head? We know the truth, and we're affirming it. There's an emotional thing that we see. But why is it that when the going gets tough this week that we're going to wrestle with it? And we're going to ask the same things. God, are you able? God, have you forgotten me? I have a reasonable request here, God, and we grapple with it and we wrestle with it. And I want to encourage you, you're in good company. This is the truth of the saints of all times. They grappled with these things. Look in verse 27. I want you to notice something I think significant there. Notice what he says. Why do you say, oh, what? Oh, Jacob. And the next one says, and speak who? Oh, Israel. Those two names are significant because they apply to the same individual, right? You remember Jacob? That was his name. And then the Lord said, now I'm going to call you Israel. And that change of names, I think, was very pivotal for our passage today. Do you remember when that name change took place? Remember the context? He was out traveling, and that night he wrestled with, didn't he? And I want us to go back. He was wrestling, and we wrestled as well. Go with me to Genesis 32. I want you to see this in Scripture today. Genesis 32 you and I, like Jacob of old, will wrestle with God at times in our suffering and our trials. And I think this passage helps us a little bit to understand this context and our suffering. Uh, Genesis 32, break in at verse 24. 
Then Jacob was left alone, and a man, and if you have a, a Bible similar to mine, you're going to see it's capitalized, which means it is probably referring to a theophany or Christophany. This is the Lord himself. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Uh, so again, put yourself in your suffering and just imagine grappling with the Lord in your suffering through the night. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Just a reminder that he grappled with the Lord. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. The reason I think this is significant is because in this passage, it was sufficient that Jacob saw God and that God blessed him. God did not answer all the questions that Jacob could have had on that occasion about his future and all that was going to take place. It was enough for him to see God and be blessed by God. You and I wrestle with God, and we are a people who at times, let's be honest, we doubt. Would you agree with that? There are times we would say, God, I believe, but help my unbelief because I'm struggling. It's severe. It's painful. I don't understand it. And, and a doubt, there is a doubt that is unhealthy. There is a doubt that is destructive. It denies. But folks, if you have a doubt that seeks understanding, I think that's a gift. I, I think to want to seek the Lord and to have some understanding is good. But dear saint, let me remind you that often it's necessary that we see God and we do not understand. I think God in his wisdom often says, it is enough that you wrestle with me. It's enough that you grapple with these things. But I'm not going to tell you everything you want to know, but I am going to bless you. And you're going to be reminded that you met with me at this place. And whether it be a hip, hip that's out of joint or, or maybe you've got to set up some stones or make a sign or something, you need to be reminded that I grappled with the Lord. I didn't get my answers, but I know him. I saw him and I can trust him. You see, by faith, right now, when we're asked the question, when we're challenged, behold your God, we're able to say yes and amen. Again, because His salvation has flooded our soul. He is the God of glory, full of majesty, the Lord God Almighty. He's revealed Himself to us. If you've trusted in Christ, you're comforted, you have confidence, and you can have renewed strength in your trial. Go with me to Psalm 73. We'll close out with this passage today. Psalm 73. And if you don't mind marking your Bibles, I would encourage you in Isaiah there to write that Genesis 32 about Jacob and Israel where he wrestled with God, but also write Psalm 73 because I find this to be a very fitting response to what is presented to the people in Isaiah chapter 40. Psalm 73, and we can go down to the end of this Psalm. Psalm 73 beginning in verse 25. The message of Isaiah is comfort, behold your God, Behold your God, and I think this is a good response that I hope is your response as well. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. I like that closing out, don't you? It is good for me to draw near to God. To be refreshed, to be renewed, I can trust you. But notice also there's a responsibility. I will declare all your works. To be a people who have been comforted by God, he's concerned about us, but we have to be a people that go out and tell others of this Lord God Almighty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for this wonderful chapter in Isaiah. And I pray, Father, that you would do so much more than I could with it and embed it upon our hearts that we might be those people who behold you, who, like Paul said to the believers at Galatia, before whose eyes you were publicly crucified, even though they weren't there by faith, it's as if they were. And Lord, even though we are not privileged to, to be at the Mount of Transfiguration, you do reveal yourself to us. Glimpses of glory. You hide us often in the cleft of the rock. 
you pass by that we might just get just, just a small sampling of how majestic and great you are. And I pray, Father, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts anew to understand and to receive all more of your glory. And Lord, inasmuch as we wrestle with you and we don't get all the answers that we feel like we're deserved, may it be enough that we see you and that we can trust you and teach us day by day just how much we need you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.